All right. We are live on Facebook with uh, my man, David Washington. He's at D to the Wash on Instagram. Uh, he played high school baseball in San Diego, drafted by the St. Louis Cardinals, played with the Baltimore Orioles, uh, made his big league, big league debut with them. Um, two seasons with the Long Island Ducks, and recently with the Milwaukee Milkman, brand new organization, just found out. He was the first baseman and right fielder, um, only 29 years old, played 11 seasons professionally so far, man. Uh, I still think you got a lot left in the tank, uh, yes, sir. And, we'll, and we'll talk about that here. But uh, give the people who may be listening here uh, an idea. Who is David Washington? Give us your journey, your baseball journey. Tell us a little bit of, uh, about yourself. Okay, so uh, born and raised in San Diego, California. Um, was a two-sport athlete in, uh, in high school, uh, baseball and basketball. Um, drafted in the 15th round by the, by the St. Louis Cardinals. And, uh, you know, like you said, been playing, playing professional baseball since. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm not good at the, the whole bio. Uh, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's me. What, uh, what got you into baseball? Like when you were a young guy, like were you always – you said you were a two-sport athlete. What was the other sport? Basketball. So what got you into baseball? Um, for me, I was the same way. I played basketball coming up, football, volleyball, um, and I always wanted to be a basketball player. And I like basketball way more than baseball. But I just – two points per game average wasn't going to get me a college scholarship. So <laughs> I wasn't in the play baseball. What was it for you? Like what got you to choose baseball or got you to stick with baseball from when you were a kid? Uh, so as a kid, I was, I was just into sports, anything, uh, anything competitive. Um, that I could, you know, be an athlete and I wanted to do. And just as it, you know, as I kept going and it narrowed down, it just ended up being those two that I, that I really fell in love with. Um, and then, then come high school time, honestly, it was, the decision was just, you know, which one is going to take me further, do I think? And uh, getting drafted in baseball, I, I felt like that was the move. So obviously you, when you were drafted coming up through high school and then, and, you know, being drafted and making your way through the minors into the major leagues, were there any struggles that you had to go through um, and overcome? I'm sure there had to be uh, as far as baseball is related. Yeah. I, um, when I look back at it, kind of, it kind of seems like the whole thing was a struggle. Like, or, you know, like, it, it, you know, it, it never hasn't been a struggle. Um, but I think overall, the biggest struggle for me has always been um, un, like dealing with the, the failure that's going to naturally come, come about in this game and knowing that, you know, the things that I'm doing to prepare myself are the right things. And I don't need to change them just because I'm, I had a couple bad days in a row. I think that's always been my, my biggest struggle. And, you know, baseball is – a game of failure. I tell my young players all the time, like you Absolutely. have to be a good failure. If you want to play baseball, you have to be a good failure because you're going to fail. The best guys fail seven out of 10 times. And a lot of the times it's coached by negative people. Meaning if you make an <laughs> error out there, they're going to be yelling at you. Like, come on, you got to get that ball. Why are you, you know, making the exactly. error instead of like, you know, uh, you know, and there's some good coaches. Don't get me wrong. There's some good coaches. Right. Like, hey, come on, let's get them next time. And, and there's some good teammates, but for the most part, it's a game of failure coached by uh, negative people. So you've got to be able to, you know, have that thick skin and, and be able to overcome and, and, and adapt to failure because that's a huge part of it. Let me ask you this. Every kid's dream, or at least kids who play baseball, their dream is to play in the major leagues. And what was it like? What was the feeling like? Take us back to that moment that experience when you got the call up, how did it happen? You know, you know, who told you, who did you tell, just take us through the whole experience of when you got that. Yeah. So uh, let's see, we were, we had just gotten back to Norfolk from, uh, I want to say Durham, but I, I, I'm not sure. We had just gotten back from the trip and uh, I had just got into the clubhouse, was getting ready to, I think I had just gotten into the cage, gotten my, you know, my start of the day swings in. And I was back in the clubhouse, just kind of hanging, you know, kicking back. There wasn't really anybody in there. And uh, the manager came up to me and kind of casually, casually told me that, uh, hey, you're going to be uh, going to have to get your stuff together. You're going to be meeting the meeting the team in Chicago. 
tonight. And uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, I think everybody I've heard talk about it says it's, it's indescri- indescribable. Um, I would I would agree with that. Best I can come up with is I think for like the next the next two hours, I didn't feel like I had any control over the muscles in my face. Like, I don't know if you, have you ever felt like that kind of like excitement where you just don't know what everything's doing. Right. I like, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of how I felt. And I, uh, I, I remember I called my dad. The first thing I did was I called my dad and then, um, and then, yeah, then just got to, got to get my stuff together and getting out of there. That's so cool. Did you have any like idea that it was coming or was it out of the blue or, uh, you know, it was funny because I think looking back, there were definitely, I was doing well at the time. And, uh, and I think the day before I got called up because Chris Davis had, uh, had pulled a, pulled in, uh, an oblique, I want to say so he had a minor injury. So it was there. Like I could have, I could have seen the signs, but it, it wasn't in my head that, Oh, I might, I might, I might be going up. It just wasn't something, honestly, it wasn't something that I really, gave myself time to think about because I felt like it would distract from what I was trying to do. Right. What, uh, let me, let me ask you this. What was more, um, of a crazy experience for you? I'm sure both special in their own way, but getting drafted or getting the big league call up? Uh, getting the big league call up was, was, was crazy. I, like, I don't know. It's tough. Cause getting drafted, Getting drafted was crazy to see, uh, like how everybody else reacted. I remember, I still remember, I still remember being at school because it happened like during class and like coming out of class, I got, I just got like swarmed by a bunch of people. And that was crazy because I had no like context for that. But I don't know, to go, what, eight plus years, eight plus years working towards something, not being sure if it was ever going to happen and then having it happen is uh is pretty special that is, that is really cool now you you had all that experience in affiliated pro ball then you got to play two years with the long island ducks um do you know digme by the way yeah yeah i was gonna say uh ray right ray Navarrete. yeah 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 so he so a, a guy i went to school with grew up with um he played with the ducks as well he was only there for a couple of weeks um, before he got hurt and, and left, but he got to meet Ray. And then I played in the Mets organization and I, and I believe Ray played there beforehand. So a lot of the guys were wearing the Digby stuff. Yeah. Uh, but I was wondering if you had that connection. Um, did you yeah, get I got to meet him. Or, oh, okay. Yeah. He was, or he's already a long, a long Island legend by the time I, uh, by the time I got there, he has, <laughs> he has his number retired and all that stuff. So, uh, yeah. and so now you went from, uh, Long Island and this is going to be the first season with the, with the, uh, Milkman, milkman. Um, what like what's what's going on? What do you see in your future with baseball? Like, are you still striving to get back to the big leagues, or like what what's the current state of baseball with you right now? So, I, yeah, I'm. Uh, I think my my goals as a player have kind of shifted from you know playing in the big leagues for 15 years to just playing at the highest level that I possibly can for as long as I can. You know, um, I think I, I kind of recognize that being in indie ball for two years, going on three years, it, you know, in, in today's game, is, it's, it's, uh, it would be, it's a very uphill, uphill battle to get back to the big leagues. But uh, the passion for just, for just being the best player that I can be and, and competing and, and earning the respect of my peers on the field I think that's something that uh, that I'll always enjoy, regardless of where I'm at. Yeah, that's huge, and and having that self awareness is is huge too, because I know there's there's many guys who who prolong or or you know try to do more than is not not that they're capable of, but just have uh, unrealistic ideas of what's going on. And just having that self-awareness, I think, is huge, especially for young players, too, because there's a lot of young players who, uh, you know, have aspirations of playing Major League Baseball. But if they have more self-awareness or maybe their parents provided more self-awareness or taught them how to have self-awareness, they might say, you know what, maybe, you know, maybe it is uh, soccer 
that uh, that I need to be focusing on or something like right. that, you know? And it's hard. Like, for me, I thought I was going to play basketball in the NBA. Obviously, I was no good at it, but it took me an experience to go through that experience to understand that, uh, to have that. But um, that's really cool. That's a really great point because it's not always about how – uh, you know, what level you can play at, but also what you can do in the moment where you're at, being a good teammate, contributing, right. you know, and those are the things, the experiences that you can do to have success, especially as a young athlete and even at the highest levels like you in the big leagues. Um, that, that's huge. T- tell us about that. Tell us what is the difference between like playing in high school and playing at the, at the highest level of the game and like the, the teammates and the camaraderie and stuff like that? Uh, just, so on the teammate aspect of it, just, um, just growing in this game, some, just a point I wanted to make is that like, I don't know, now when I talk to guys about other players, it's, it's, it's like, it's not so much about there. We might spend like 10 to 15 seconds talking about like, wow, that guy's great swing. Like, man, that guy can pick it. I got this, this and that. But like, if we're talking about like teammates, it's like, what kind of teammate was he? Uh, like, you know, the first thing, the biggest thing people say about other people is like, man, that's a good guy, a good teammate, you know, I, like really enjoy being with that guy. So it's like it becomes more about the person that you are in the clubhouse and, and, and you know, with your teammates than it is how, how well you play. Obviously, we all want to play well and all that. But, but when, you know, a few years removed from that season, you're going to think about – you're going to think more about, like, the people that you were around than – than what kind of players they were. Um, and I think that's just maturity that, that goes on as you, as you grow up and, and you see that play out as you, as you move along. When you, get to, when you get to AAA big leagues, you know, guys are less – I, I, I want to say cutthroat because I haven't played with a lot of cutthroat guys, but, like, you know, it's everybody recognizes that this that this game is hard, and and we're all just we're all just trying to get what we can out of it. Yeah, that's so true. And you make lifelong friends. Like I still keep in touch with a lot of the guys that I came, a lot of the good guys, uh, right? That I came up with, and and you know that's because you're living together. You're 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 out there competing towards the same goal. So you have this like brother brotherhood that you yeah. know is unbreakable. And and there's a lot of guys that I have played with that I, that I still keep in touch with and love like brothers. So uh, it's, it's, you know, baseball is great for that aspect too. Let me ask you this. Who were some of the role models that you had growing up? Because when I was younger, you know, I looked up to a lot of, a lot of athletes and um, that, that was real motivation for me. Their stories, like the struggles that w- they went through and overcame, mm-hmm. that was a real motivation to me. Were there any role models that you had when you were growing up? Mm, uh, it was always, it was honestly growing up, it was always about, it was always about the players. I, I always, I always just modeled myself after, you know, who I wanted to play like, uh, Tony Gwynn, Ken Griffey in the, you know, in the early years, just the, the, the smooth lefty swing. Um, Albert Pujols, I remember was, was a big one for me around high school age. I can I honestly couldn't tell you why, but I wanted to be left-handed Albert Pujols so bad. So I and then you know getting drafted by the Cardinals and and seeing him in camp was unbelievable. Uh, yeah, those are the ones. And then you know basketball, you got MJ, you know, Le, you know LeBron and all that. But but yeah, baseball, I would say Pujols. I would say Pujols, Gwynn, and Griffey were the guy. And and as a, as a professional, I would say uh, Miguel Cabrera. But, I, like, yeah, besides that, that's about it. Well, those are good guys to look up to for sure. Those are, those are good players. Yeah, for sure. Those are guys, good guys to aspire to be like. Um, yeah. that, that's funny. Um, what would you – do you have kids? I do not. I do not. So what would you say to parents, from your perspective, parents who have young players now going through the landscape of youth baseball, What what advice would you give to them uh, to help their players um, come up? And, and if they aspire to be professional players, what, what advice do you have for them? Uh, parents is tough, especially not, not being, not being a parent. Um, but when 
the the experience that I've had in talking to you players and seeing seeing kind of that uh, that scene is um, I think I think you got to kind of uh, manage expectations. Um, understand that your your kid's going to struggle and is not going to be as good as some other kids and uh and encourage and you know encouraging him to to deal with some of that adversity or uh and, or just you know and and ultimately just have fun you know to to get out and just play and not not treat it like it's you know like we're all getting paid millions of dollars to play youth baseball you know it's that I, I'm a big believer in multiple sports and, and, you know, in creating athleticism and because they're going to have to learn how to move differently at some point, no matter how good of a coach you are or coaches you surround them with, as they grow, they're going to have to learn to move and, and look playing different sports. I think helps a lot with that for, uh, for a player that wanted that uh, is looking to play professionally, I would say, to, to learn to be a really good student of the game um, and learn what that means. Uh, I think, you know, if you have to tell, if you have to tell someone to, to work hard, they're, they're not ready to be a professional. Every, every professional athlete works hard. They have that. That's the first separator, I think. But after that, it's the ability to, uh, to access um, process and like implement information. So being able to being able to study the game and yourself and 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 use that information to make yourself better i think is is what's gonna what's gonna get you as far as you can go in the game professionally that's great i like i love that you said student in the game in fact i was in the this was kind of weird but i was in the shower yesterday and i thought <laughs> of this acronym smash and i'm not sure i'm going to remember all of the letters off the top of my head but s was student of the game so yeah i was trying to think what encompasses a great player and it was student of the game master of feel m for smash mm -hmm. uh, attacker of fear mm. um what's the next letter s m a s I forgot the last two, but those, those were the first three. This was just in the shower the other day. It's weird. Like, you know, you're just sitting there thinking, I was washing my hair and I'm like, what does it really take? And, you know, and I came up with that. I was like, those letters spell something. I got to remember that. I got to sit down and remember that. But that's, that's funny that you said, student. Yeah. Like, oh, hardest worker in the room was H. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I got that one from the rock. He, he always talks about when you walk into a room, you always want to be the hardest worker. Absolutely. The Absolutely. Uh, what type of player were you? So, like, as far as, like, role-wise and, and positional-wise, hitting-wise, what type of player were you? So, uh, first base, first base outfield, um, corner, corner positions, uh, you know, I think on defense, on defense, it, uh, if I could make the plays that I'm supposed to make, I was doing my job. Um, I, I don't think anybody was expecting me to be a gold glove outfielder, but, you know, make catch the ball is supposed to catch throw the ball where it's supposed to go um hitting hitting you know power and uh you know looking to looking to drive runs in create create offense quickly and um base running i i i i was kind of a sneaky base runner um you know large profile people kind of assume that i couldn't run and I, I could, I could sneak you, you know, seven to 10 bags a year, you know, if, you know, if you need it. But uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Like Cardinals organization was always, everything was preaching, like, you know, check as many boxes as you can. You know, everybody was, you know, nobody, nobody was really encouraged to be one dimensional. You know, every, you know, every, every aspect of the game, we can, you know, we can make a, make an impact in some way or another. Let me ask you this. What was it that made you a power hitter? Did you naturally have that in your body? Was, were there certain things that you worked on, certain drills, exercises? What can – I'm asking you this in case there's uh, younger players who aspire to have more power in their swing. What could they do? What did you do? So for me personally, I grew – I kind of grew into most of my power. 
Um, I when I got drafted and went to the GCL my first season, I didn't get one extra base hit. And just kind of growing in, you know, finding grown man strength and and working out and playing baseball as a job. I kind of uh, I naturally developed pop, so the balls that I hit just started to go a little bit further. So there's that. Um, but a big shift that took me from, you know, from kind of being like 10 to 15 home runs to like 20, maybe even 30 was that I started to, I started to look at myself as a power hitter instead of, you know, somebody that was just trying to, you know, just trying to get hits and, and every now and then the power would come, I would start hunting for, you know, hunting pitches to drive more and, and not, and it, you know, I, I probably strike out too much, but but accepting that I'm going to strike out more than most people, and and being using that to be aggressive, um, that so that mindset shift is I think the big thing that that developed for me, and learning to learning to drive the ball the other way, learning to use 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 the whole field, but that's I don't know if that's something that I would. Like the drills that I went through for that, I think were credit to my hitting coach. They were they were very uh, they were very personal for me. I don't know if I would say, "Hey, everybody, go and do this." Right. Yeah, and I think that's how hitting drills need to be used. It's almost as a prescription. So if you're working on something very specific, there's a drill that could help you specifically. And each player is going to be different, and the drills are going to be different different times in your career when you're struggling with different things. That's really cool. But the one thing that you said there that really stood out to me was when you made that mental shift, and when you identify as somebody, something you're you're going to try to align with that. You're naturally you're going to try to align with that. And that sounds like what happened with you. And, you know, it goes back to that self-awareness too, like we were talking about before. Like if you could have the self-awareness and then identify with an optimistic point of within that self-awareness, you're going to start to try to align with that. My, my own example was I always played very fearful. Um, as mm. a pitcher, I, I was very fearful it's all the way through college. And then one day I, I fielded a ball in the game and airmailed it over the first baseman's head. <laughs> and I just remember, like, I didn't want to feel that way ever again because I felt scared. I was playing scared. Anytime they called fastball inside and I went to throw, I'd be like, I hope I don't hit this guy. I hope I don't hit, you know, oh, yeah. I played, always. Um, luckily, I was talented, so I, I snuck by. Um, but it wasn't until I said, you know what? I am not going to be that player anymore. I want to be the most confident player that I can be. And I never want to feel that way again. It was one decision. I made it. And then I started to align that way. Yeah. And that day on, that was it. And that was the year that I became an All-American, got drafted, and had all my success from that one decision that aligned wow. like you're talking about. So that's it's, it's crazy how you just like, if you just if you just tell yourself, I'm going to be this person, and like and commit to it like you will just do it mm -hmm. and, and like that sounds i don't know that sounds weird but that was like like in double a i had the same kind of experience i uh i started out okay and then i i struggled a little bit and then i was i was like the 25th guy on the roster i went back down to high a and and had a terrible time like i like the it was it was awful right and then and then they called me back up to double a which I thought meant I was just about to get released because like, if you get it right, if you get a promotion when you're struggling, you're about to get released. <laughs> right. So, and I, and like, I got back up to, uh, I got back up to double a and all I, all I knew was like, I love double a so much more than single a and like, I'm going to commit to, if, if this is going to be it, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to be the most relaxed. I'm going to enjoy this as much as I possibly can. And I started playing like that. I started playing like somebody, you know, not even, not even like with nothing to lose, but that just wasn't, wasn't too concerned with, with whatever outcomes just, you know, I'm just here to play and being that guy. I don't know. Yeah, no, it's so true. It sounds easy. Like when we're saying it, like you just, uh, just tell yourself it's going to be all right. And it, but yeah. it's really not. It's just just tell yourself you're going to be a big leader. You'll be yeah. A big leader. Well, you know what's funny? You say that, and I think that was the reason why I never made it to the big leagues. Because my whole goal and my whole mind when I was young was to get drafted. Mm -hmm. And you did. I, I got drafted. And then yeah. I think from that point on, I was just like, 
I made it. I did, you know? And so I was just cruising through the minor leagues. You know, I didn't yeah. have that net, I didn't have that the ultimate goal, which I should have I should have said I want to be a big leaguer. And you know what's funny? I talked to a few big leaguers who said they wish they would have said they want to be a career big leaguer or like a Hall of Famer. Right, so, right. So they played a few years in the big leagues, but they didn't get to the level they that was their goal getting to the big leagues, but they should have shot for, you know, more It's hard it's it's so hard to expect something that big from yourself like it's and i think that's something that that we could talk like people in general could talk more with young players about like that 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 unreasonable level of confidence that it takes for somebody who's just starting out in pro ball to say i'm going to be a hall of famer like that's that's a that's almost a talent in itself and and I and and it, I don't, like you have to be willing to be wrong, because nobody like if if I say I'm gonna be if I say I'm gonna be a Hall of Famer and then I don't, no one's gonna they're not gonna put me in jail, right? It'll be just fine. They're like, oh, he had he had really big expectations for himself and he fell short, but no one's gonna hold that against me, right? But we but we're scared to do that. We're scared to <laughs> we're scared right. to say like I'm gonna I'm gonna be great, right? Yeah, and it's doubt. It's all self doubt, and yeah. you know, and that's normal. And that's a normal thing. It's totally normal. I, if we asked, I'm sure, I'm sure, a hundred percent of people would say that that there's there's yeah. some form of self doubt in there. It's just how do we how do we knock that down and become the most optimistic, <laughs> you know, have that most optimistic vision of ourselves so we can attain that in the future. That's really cool. Was there any other like m- like mindset? things that you did like were you into like uh meditation or yoga or anything like i know some guys are crazy you know have all kinds of stuff um and then other guys just like visualize or some guys do nothing was there anything as far as mindset wise that you did um so in the off season there's a there was a uh, a group workout that was kind of like a uh it was kind of kind of like a uh an active meditation session that like uh a big group of us, mostly pitchers, would do here, and um, and a lot of that had to do with uh, maintaining, you know, maintaining the mindset that you want with fatigue. So as your, you know, as your body gets tired, and your your, you know, your brain responds to that. It, where where do where does your mind want to go? What kind of thoughts start creeping in? How well can you control them? And uh, and I think that that kind of training translated, even though, you know, it it might not have been something that I felt during the season, but where other guys, you know, during the season you get fatigued. Right. And, and you notice like you might be a little more negative than you normally would be. And you don't know why, but it's like that because you're, you're fatigued from the season. And I think training that in the off season kind of helped me, you know, keep stay in the, you know, stay in the fight. It will, you know, a little bit longer than I might have otherwise where, you know, some, some adversity over the course of the season might've taken me offline. I was able to, you know, stay in the right place a little bit more. So, yeah, I think, I think training the, I think training the mind to, uh, to be in control of itself is, is a big deal. Yeah, that's huge. I totally agree. My, my father was big into, he was not a baseball guy at all. He could not help me with baseball in one bit, but he was good. He was a football player in high school, but he was really good with, he got me into visualization and I, I always would visualize what I wanted to happen before it happened. So like it for a game example, like if we had a big game the next day, I would sit there, lay in bed before I fell asleep and just visualize myself striking everybody out or doing really well. And the more real I can get with the visualization, seeing, like actually seeing the colors of the jersey of the team we're playing and, and seeing the guys, if I knew the guys that I was facing, the more real I can make it hap- happen in my head, the more uh, of the times it would come to fruition the next day. Mm-hmm. So more- can, I, can I ask you something about that? Yeah. What uh was that like were you were you making the decisions in the in in the uh in the visualization like or were you yourself executing executing the pitches or were you kind of like watching a movie of yourself? Well, that's a great question. That's 
a great question because it was more like it, it was me. It wasn't like I was watching a movie from a further distance. It was me. It was first person. It was first person, but I wasn't, I wasn't in control. I was letting it happen. Yeah. Okay. Until something happened that I didn't like. And then I would zone in and try to like, if, if I, if I'm visualizing and they start hitting bombs off me, I got to, <laughs> you know, I got to take control over this visualization. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's not going to be a good day when that starts happening. So I would, I would, I would let it happen for the most part, gotcha. uh, but it wasn't really directed. If I guess if that's what you're asking, I was kind of letting it happen, but I tried to keep it on a positive note, <laughs> a positive right. note. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. What about you? How, what made you ask that question? I guess I should say. Uh, no, it's just, it's just that I've never, I've never done too much visualization. Um, as far as like the, like what you're talking about where I, like I'll I'll step out of the box in that bat and kind of visualize the swing that I want to take, right? Or the uh, you know, and, and I'll try to match that up. But I won't like before a game. I've never been the guy that like uh, imagine imagine seeing a curveball and hitting it. Imagine seeing you know. I was always uh, I, I was more feel and uh, I don't know practice, but uh, yeah, I find that interesting and kind of how that. Yeah, like what, what, which way in, in that is, is better to, you know, to, to make the act or to see what, you know, right. see yourself do well? Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I was never trained again. It was just my dad was like telling me what he knew and he was just a high school football player. So it wasn't like anything, you know, he could have been making it up for all I know. I don't know, but it worked, it worked for me. But it's funny you said that, that you would step out and visualize and then in later in a sentence you said feel and, you know, when we were talking before, I said student of the game, master of feel. I think, too, I say the word visualize a lot, but it's really more of a feeling, too. Like, it's a visceral thing. Like, right. you step out of the box and you're visualizing your swing. You're, like, you can feel it in your body almost without even doing it. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Is that yeah. true? Yeah. 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 It was the same thing with me in the visualization. Mm-hmm. So like yeah, you would know you would know what the feeling of a good pitch was, without without making that motion, right? Yeah, right. and 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 it was very visceral in my visualization. So I would be seeing it and feeling it at the same time, Gosh. even though I'm even though I'm laying there or sitting there or whatever it is. You know what's cool too is there was a study they did in I think it was Australia, where this guy. Um, they had a dartboard and he threw the darts lefty. He was a righty. He was a right-handed thrower mm -hmm. Threw the darts lefty. And then for one month, all he was allowed to do was visualize five minutes a day about hitting the bullseye, throwing lefty. So right. five minutes a day, he visualized hitting the bullseye, hitting the bullseye left-handed. He came back a month later threw the uh, darts left-handed and he was twice as close from like they measured all the darts the first time and they measured all yeah. the darts the second time, twice as close the second time. And he wasn't allowed to pick up a dart and he hit the bullseye like six times. Left wow. Yeah. 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 So it's not like, it's not like some crazy thing that like just you said, like a lot of like, that's a visualization is a, like a, a very real thing. And yeah, a bunch of teammates that were, that were real big on it. I, yeah, I don't know. I can, I don't know. I couldn't, I guess I couldn't buy into it when when people would tell me it, it uh, like yeah but it definitely works well it's weird it's like you know it's it's definitely like uh you know ooh, <laughs> you know like yeah you know. but it's baseball like you have to have some of it if you don't have a little bit of that you're playing baseball <laughs> right. um, you know right right you know and baseball players are very pretty superstitious you know there's a lot of us that have crazy do you have did you have any crazy superstitions or anything like that Nah, I, um, I could get on a, it, you know, if, um, if I was doing well, I could get on a streak of something. So if I'm, I, I, so the one, the biggest one was in Johnson city and rookie ball. It was the first time I ever had Zaxby's and, uh, and I had Zaxby's for about a month straight before the game because I was raking. So I like I was so I would go and get the same sandwich every day like that like stuff like that yeah or if, if it's not broke don't fix it but I never had like you know any of that like uh, OCD type of uh, type of superstition I didn't have anything like that 
That's so funny. I did the same thing with the food. <laughs> That's so funny. What about on the other end of the spectrum? Let's say you get into a slump. How, what did you do to get yourself out of a slump when you were in a slump? Oh, just cry. <laughs> no um that's still that to this day is the the biggest thing the um what i've come up with so far is if if i can if i can if i'm like like really in a slump like not like not like a not like a couple bad games where it's like i don't know what i'm doing at the plate and i'm asking and i'm like i don't I, somebody help me nothing's working uh what I've come up with is if I can, if I can switch my focus to like being the best example of how to slump for, for my teammates, like if I switch, if I switch my, my, my focus to that, like from the day I get to the ballpark, if anybody's paying attention to me, they're going to go, they're going to go, wow, that guy's struggling and he is handling it well. Like I'm gonna, like I'm, like I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna cuss or anything when I come back in the dugout from, you know, from a bat at bat. Uh, I'm gonna root my teammates on, and for all, for all anybody can see, I'm just gonna be having a, having a normal day. And when I've done that, I've is when I started hitting those line drives right at people, you know, and like, and people started, oh, dude, you're almost there, you got, you're right there. And then, I, and I'm not thinking about that. I'm just like, just don't show them how frustrated you are. And I think, and I'm not like, I don't know if that, that's not always going to work. Like you're not going to do that and then, and then start hitting, but at least, at least you're making a positive contribution to like the culture of the team. That's, that's a great point. And that kind of goes back to, at least in, in my perspective, kind of goes back to that alignment thing where you're like saying, Hey, um, it's almost like, you're aware of that you're in a slump, but you're saying, I'm going to be this guy anyway. You know, I'm still going to yeah. contribute. I'm still going to be the best player. I'm still going to – and obviously your goals are still to hit that line drive or whatever. So you're, you're, you're trying to align with what you believe is, is – you, you mm -hmm. want to happen. That's, that's – that's You know, I never thought about it like that, but that's a good point because when, when we're in a slump, it's like, for me, you're ch I'm chasing the result. You know, I need a hit. And it's like, like, hot, like, and it's like every single at bat, I just, it's like you just get, just get enough confidence back to think like, this is going to be the one. This is going to be the time where I get to have a break out of it right here. And then you don't, and it's crushing. And then it's a cycle. You just get back to chasing the result just in time to not get the result. And it drives you crazy. But if you stop chasing the result, then, you know, you break out of that cycle. And the cycle, like you said, too, I think a lot of guys when they're in a slump are saying, I'm in a slump. Like they're saying, I'm in a slump. And they're identifying with that. So it's, again, it's that, it's that cycle. You know, I saw an interview one playoff with uh, the, the announcer was asking Pedroia, like, what's the matter? What's going on with your swing? How come you're, you know, he was like over 11 or something in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. what's, what's going on? And he looked at the, the, the reporter like, they were crazy. Like, what are you talking about? I'm smoking balls right now all over the <laughs> field. He's like, they're just catching them. And I yeah. was like, wow, that's such a good perspective to have on it. Like, you know, <laughs> imagine being 0 for 11 in the playoffs and, yeah. and having that perspective of like, I'm, and he, you could tell in his eyes, like he was totally confused about the question. Like, are you kidding me? I'm absolutely yeah. ripping right now. Yeah. And you can't he, tell those, you can't tell those guys, those guys that they don't rake. <laughs> right. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what like. It doesn't matter what's going on in the moment. Those guys know how good they are. Right. I was having a, a conversation too with one of my buddies who was in the big leagues, and and we were getting on the so, uh, the subject of confidence, and how a lot of the great players in the big leagues have like this super confidence. And it, it he we were talking and he was saying that he thinks that's a huge reason. And we kind of touched on it before, but he thinks it's got a huge reason why those guys made it because in the minor leagues, and I'm sure you can attest to this, that the, the, unless you're like a superstar, the level of talent is pretty, you know, pretty the same in the minor leagues. Mm -hmm. It comes down mm -hmm. to a lot of consistency and execution um, on how, how you do it. But, I believe that the extreme confidence can help you with that and give you that that 
cycle upward. I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, the, the confidence is obvious. Yeah, if you if you have confidence versus if you don't, it's I mean, it's a crazy difference. The, the struggle for me is like, it's like everybody knows that, but you can't, you can't fake it. Right. You can try. It's tough. But if you, yeah, if you don't, if you don't believe yourself to be, you know, the man, you know, you can tell yourself you're the man, but you have to believe it. That's a I great, think. that's a great point. And I got a question for you and I have no idea of the answer. And it just made me think because I have a three-year-old son now mm-hmm. and I know you don't have any children. Um, but what do you, where do you, where do you think we get that from? Do you think we're born with that? Like, do you think like someone is born with like, okay, they're going to be like a self doubter or they're just going to be confident. Or do you think like that's instilled upon us along the way? Like how do you, I don't know, like, where do you think you got your confidence from and where do you got your self doubt from? Like, where do you think it was uh, environment or is that just a natural thing? Like, Hey, I'm six foot four. I was going to be tall naturally. Like, you know? Yeah. Uh, I don't, well, I definitely don't think it's something, I don't think it's something that, you know, that we're, that's like forced upon us or that we're, you know, necessarily born with. We can be, I think we can be born into different situations that, that make it easier or harder to, to have confidence. Um, and we all react to, I think our environment differently, but, um, but I think it's something we can practice. I just think it's, I, I think it's really hard to, I think it's, it's deeper than, you know, just, just practicing your skills a whole bunch. And then if you, you know, if you, if you do that enough, you'll get the results. And if you get the results, you'll have the confidence. I think, I think there's a better way, a more efficient way to do it than that. I think, uh, you know, if we, if we get, if we really look at ourselves and how we, our perspective on everything and, and what, what we view as, as good and bad and, and, and that kind of thing where, you know, if we look at failure differently, if we look at failure as making us, making us better, then we probably, it'd probably be easier for us to walk around with confidence because every time we, every time we like arrogantly went into a situation and got knocked on our butt, we would, it, we would look at it as, oh, wow, we just got way better. So we wouldn't be, like you talked about, like if, if your, you know, if your mindset pitching early on had been, let me see how many home runs I can give up. Because every home run I give up or every hit batter or every error, or everything would make me the best player possible. Then like every time you did do one of those things, is like your confidence would grow instead of getting knocked back down. So I think it's more a matter of perspective than, than anything else. That's great, man. I love to hear it. Thank you for taking these questions. I know we went totally off topic. And no, that was I, awesome. I appreciate you, you coming on because that was super insightful, man. And I think a lot of people who are watching this are going to take a few things away from this. And that at least is my whole goal is to help as many young players as I can and I appreciate you for doing the same where can people follow you at so um at at d to the wash is uh is my uh Instagram page I actually just started a uh, another Instagram page where I'm kind of recording my process as a uh, as a player um which is called it's actually ironically called coach d wash um at coach d wash so if you you know if you're more interested in uh and kind of like my thoughts on the process and, and more, I, you know, I post like my hitting videos and kind of what I'm working on. Um, so if you want to see that stuff, it's at, at coach, coach D wash. Um, yeah. And thank you. Thank you so much for having me on. This has been just for the conversation. It's been an awesome conversation. I, I, I've really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you too for me as well. You know, being stuck inside, it's always great to talk and talk baseball too. It's it's awesome. Absolutely. Thank you very much, guys. Go check out Coach D Wash on Instagram, man. You can't get better a better resource than that because so, someone who's still going through it currently, a professional player, and taking you through the process, like you got to jump all over that, man. Um, so check him out on Instagram. Thank you again so much, and. Uh, if you got any questions, head over there, ask them. You can leave them in the comments wherever you're finding this video. 
And uh, thank you for joining us. So let me shut this recording off and shut off this Facebook, and then we can talk a little more. <laughs>